All right, guys. So today we're going to talk about analog and digital signals. Analog and digital signals. So when we say signal, typically we're talking about changes over time. A signal isn't one piece of information. It's a bunch of pieces of information over time. So a signal can be analog or it can be digital. I'm going to start uh, today by talking about analog signals. And the majority of what I talk about today is going to be analog signals. Okay? Now, when I talk about analog signals, the easiest way of understanding it is to talk about sound. We're all very familiar with sound. Um, and sound is a signal. What is sound? Of what? Yeah. It's like a vibration. Like, the like, way you're talking, like you're vibrating your head. Okay. How do you hear it? Okay. Uh-huh. Waves of what? Uh-huh. Waves of what? Magic? What's that? Waves of vibration. Waves of vibration? Okay. Waves of Yeah. We get let's let's put a word on it, let's say it's pressure. We get let's let's put a word on it. So what's happening, and this always kind of blows my mind, what's happening is I'm talking to you right now, is I'm vibrating the air. Right now, or whatever medium. Right now, it's air. If we were all underwater, we could still hear each other. It would just sound different, right? So I'm vibrating the air. I'm pushing it towards you and pulling it away from you very quickly by vibrating my vocal cords. Now, your ear picks up those vibrations, turns them into electrical impulses, and your brain interprets it. It does all that really fast, by the way. And then your language center picks up, and it does all the conversions so you can understand what it's saying. It's pretty impressive that all that happens. But sound is just that. It's a pressure wave, and I'm pushing towards you, pulling away from you, pushing towards you, pulling away from you. Okay? That's all sound is. Now, the process of the ear turning into an electrical impulse, we can fake that, we can sort of recreate it with electrical components. What is a device that takes sound and puts it into a computer? Sound and puts it into a computer. Microphone, sure. Right? A microphone takes sound, picks up those vibrations, those pressure waves, and turns them into electricity. In fact, if you were to look at a microphone, it's very, very simple. It is merely a cone of some kind, plastic, paper, something like that. Okay? And it's attached to a piece of metal that moves through a coil of wire. So as it vibrates, it moves past this coil of wire, and when you move it, when you move a magnet past the coil of wire, you create electricity. So that's all it is. Okay. What's interesting is that a speaker is almost exactly the same thing. It's a cone, usually paper or plastic. It's a magnet, a coil of wire, and when you generate electricity on a speaker, it moves that cone and makes the sound. So they're almost exactly the same thing. To demonstrate that here, I've got uh, Audacity, it's a free piece of software up here, and I have uh, what appear to be the world's cheapest in-ear headphones. Okay, just earbuds, JVC, <coughs> very, very cheap. These are speakers, yes? These are speakers. Very, very small speakers, but speakers nonetheless. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk into these speakers, and I'm going to see if I can reverse the effect. Let's see if I can generate a signal and send it to the computer. So if I start recording, you can actually see there's a meter up top, and it's picking up my voice as I talk into it. And it's actually creating an analog signal. We're seeing as I get louder, you can see the signal gets bigger or smaller. If I say, ah! You see that, that leap up there? And so it's, it's capturing my voice as I talk into these things. Probably not in a great quality, but you can actually see that voltage, because that's what I'm creating, creating voltage over time. Okay? So that creates a signal. Now if I zoom in on these, Where was that one where I shouted at? There we go. If I zoom in, you can really start to see 
this sort of up and down, that vibration visualized. Okay? And that's all that sound is. Electrically, and in the real world, it's just this wave. Okay? It's this signal. Right. Now, a nice wave, a nice wave is what's called a sinusoidal, what's called a sinusoidal or sine wave for short. Anybody taking trig? Use the sine function on your calculator? That's the same thing. Okay? That's the same sine, same uh, basis. So a sinusoidal wave or sine wave. Looks like that. It's really smooth, rounded tops and bottoms. Okay? That's a sinusoidal or a sine wave. These are very common. See, the nature, sine wave. Okay? Now we also have now we also have waves that are different. Okay? We've got square waves. Where we don't have that nice rounded top and bottom. Anymore. Where we don't have that nice sure. rounded top and bottom. Sure. This is not seen so often in nature. This is not seen so we don't often. see this on-off thing going on all that much. We do see it, though, in digital electronics. Because, of course, if you remember it. digital electronics, we only have two states, right? On or off. So square waves are really so common in digital really electronics. Common. Now, there are lots of other types of waves. You saw my voice print there. It was not exactly a sinusoidal wave. It wasn't exactly a square wave, maybe somewhere in between. But there's other types. Uh, this one's called a sawtooth wave. It's kind of like that, or a triangle wave. Yeah, there's lots of different types of waves. What's neat, I think, is if we actually uh, translate those into sound, Sound, we can hear the difference between those waves. We can hear, we can hear a, sound, a sinusoidal wave, we can hear what that sounds like. We can hear a square wave, we can hear a sawtooth wave, and they all sound a little bit different. Okay? Um, give me some guesses as to what you think the difference might be. How might they sound? How might they sound? What do think? Yeah. Should be what do you mean by that? I, I agree with you. What do you mean? So like, what do you mean by that? I agree with you. Highest point is going to be a very high frequency, uh -huh. so kind of like a high ringing sound. Okay. And then the lowest point. Um, okay. You might get the illusion that the volume is changing, but the volume should stay roughly the same. Okay. But it should just be a deeper sound. So I'm going to play a, a, a frequency for you. Right? I'm going to play a, a I'm play a frequency. Uh, I'm going to play a 600 hertz. <coughs> Frequency. So the 600 hertz frequency. So the 600 hertz frequency. That's 600 hertz. Okay. What that means is that this wave is going up, down, and back to center 600 times a second. Now, if I only did that one time a second, one hertz, you wouldn't be able to hear it. You wouldn't be able to. Okay. That's that's below our hearing range. We can't really hear that. One hertz. In fact, depending on the speakers and various other things, we probably can't hear much below 20 hertz. Okay? That's when it really starts to sound like a tone. And it takes a huge amount of energy to make 20 hertz audible. That's why uh, if you have like a home theater system or a sound system in your car, what makes those big low noises? Yeah. What do we call that thing, you know? Subwoofer. Subwoofer, yeah, woofer, subwoofer. Subwoofers actually typically have a whole separate power source because it takes so much power, so much energy to create sound at those low, low frequencies. Right? So you're going to have a whole separate power source for your subwoofer. Right? Now, if we go up higher, we make more waves in the same amount of time, we're increasing the frequency, which increases the pitch. Uh, uh, let's try 4,000. 4,000. So that's 4,000. That's 4,000. Okay? 
Um, uh, let's try this. Let's try this. Can you hear that? Yes. Can you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> So right now, a sound is playing, in theory, about the exact same energy as my other frequencies, but it's at 24k hertz, 24,000 hertz, which is above audible range for pretty much all humans. If there's a dog in here, I'd be freaking out. But for humans, that's above our audible range, right? Which is kind of weird that it's like happening to our ears right now, but I don't hear it. Now, hearing loss. Now, is cumulative, meaning you can lose more and more and more and more hearing over time. Uh, humans that are not very good to their ears, they go listen to that rock in concert, stand in front of the speaker, you know, tour with the Grateful Dead for a while, whatever it is you're going to do, you're going to tend to lose some of those frequencies. So adults, more often than not, are going to have a little bit less hearing range than youths such as yourselves. In fact, I'm sure you've heard of the mosquito tone, right? Where you're like, oh, this is so slick. I'm going to have a phone, a ring on my phone, but it's going to be such a high frequency that only I can hear it. That was actually developed by storekeepers, um, especially in the UK, who were annoyed with uh, teenagers like yourselves hanging out in front of their stores and loitering. And so they would just play this crazy high-pitched frequency, and all the teenagers would go, ah, and they'd leave. Uh, but the regular folks who were buying stuff at the store were like, So this 24 kHz frequency that we can't hear. Let's try something a little bit lower. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? No. 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 Okay. No. Okay. How about? Did you make it that? K hertz. Now, gentlemen, sorry to tell you this, um, but your, generally speaking, men's audible range tops out about 18K. So I was right at the tip top of your audible range. Okay? Ladies, you guys top out about 20K. Don't know really why, biologically, that is. Women can hear just a little bit higher uh, frequency range than men. So you can, you can hear it right at the tip top, and as, uh, as promised, I couldn't hear that 17.7 even a little bit. I couldn't hear it at all. It was playing, I don't know. So um, you can see it right up there. Now, there are tones that sound better to us because of you know, the music we listen to and those sorts of things. If you're a musician, um, you might like this is 440. Oops, that's a fire alarm. There's 440. That's a concert A, that's right. Concert A. So 440 hertz is a concert A. That's, that's, that's sort of a pleasing tone um, people tend to love. So just by pushing this air towards you, pulling it away from you, we hear these sounds. Okay? It's a wave. Now, I said that's a sine wave. I said that's nice. It's a, it's a round wave. It sounds pretty nice. I'm going to play a square wave for you real quick. Now, square waves are generated by digital electronics. So, when I was playing my Nintendo Entertainment System, way back when, okay, it was a digital device, meaning any music that the Nintendo Entertainment System could play was generally a sine wave, no, too difficult. Right? Sawtooth so maybe, but mostly square waves. So most of the music that was being made was a square wave. So here's, let's hear that concert A again. So here's, let's hear that concert A. Like this. There's that concert A, okay? Now let's hear it with a square wave. 
What's the difference? Nothing. They're both really annoying. <laughs> What's softer? What's softer? The first one, sine wave, right? It's smoother sound. It's a softer sound. Now, visually, I buy that because the sine wave is smoother. Not always in science do things sort of correlate that nicely, but this does work. You know, pretty clearly. You hear that? You hear that? Right? It's kind of got a harsh tone to it. Where's my sine wave? Is yeah. Let's hear sawtooth. Let's hear sawtooth. Square. Square. Sawtooth. What's the difference? Well, the pitch sounds a little bit different. The pitch sounds a little bit different. To me, it's funny. It almost sounds like a saw. It's funny. It almost got that saw sound. Yeah. Here's my square again. And my triangle. Square, triangle. Sine, triangle. Sine, triangle. What's the difference between the sine and the triangle with? What's the difference between the sine and the triangle with? Yeah, triangle is like soft. It was like a little lower pitch than something like that. Okay. Okay. A little bit harsher tone, maybe? A little bit harsher tone, maybe? So when I hear these, these sharp peaks, these sharp quarters, are those more pleasant sounds or not? Pleasant sounds or not? not. Right? They they're not as pleasant sound sounding to us. Why? Do you think? Why though? Like what is bad? Why though? Like what is bad? Why is that a thing where we're like ew? I don't like that sound. I don't like that sound. What do you think? We wonder if perhaps, we wonder if perhaps, as at the beginning, these are not sounds you find in nature, these sawtooth or these square waves. The sounds you find in nature tend to be more sinusoidal in nature. So maybe, so maybe we're just used to hearing these nice rounded waves. That's a nice thing for us to hear. There are particular frequencies that people tend to find annoying. 1K hertz, for example, tends to be, for whatever reason, pretty annoying to humans. People just like, for whatever reason, they just don't really like this 1K sound. They feel like it sounds pretty harsh and annoying. It's because it's for the Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what frequency do you think the school bell is? What frequency do you think the school bell is? Uh, 7,000. 7,000? You think it's higher than that? Let's try it. Let's hear it. Let's see if you all leave because you think it's the bell. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Probably not. Probably not. 600. Kevin says 600. Let's try 600. Oh, it's close. Let's go 700. Close. 700 a little higher? Sure. 700 a little higher? No. Right here, 650. 670. Can we hear the school bell? Now, that's. A triangle wave. Maybe I need to go to a sine wave. Yes. What do you think? Is our school bell more of a sine or a triangle? More of a square wave? Sawtooth? Probably not sawtooth. It's awesome. It sounds like one of those 80s synthesizers, right? Pretty cool. So, um, so um, these signals. We can hear them. We can hear the difference. We can hear them pretty cool. We can also see the difference. All right. Now I'd like to uh, take a moment to talk about biology. I know this is a DE class. We'll talk about biology for a second because hearing is the sound is pretty neat. It's a pretty neat concept. Um, we said in the beginning that sound. Raphael said that hitting your ears, right? We hear it. Vibration. We hear that, right? So that's pretty neat. But there's some other kind of cool processing that goes on after the fact. Our brain does some really neat stuff to sort of shape our idea of what we're hearing. Okay? So I'd like to run a little experiment. I'd like to run a little experiment. If I could. Um, I need a chair, too. Yeah, I want that chair. All right. So I'm going to run a little experiment. Okay? And here's how the experiment's going to work. 
I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. I promise I won't slap you in the face. Right. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. I'm going to walk to a place in the room, and I'm going to say point. Okay? And when I say point, I would like you to all, without opening your eyes, point at where you think I am. Okay? Then I'm going to ask you to open your eyes, and we'll see how well we did. Okay? All right. So, let's try it. Close your eyes. Let's try it. Close your eyes. Point. Point. Open your eyes. Uh, 100% accuracy. Uh, 100 accuracy. So let me ask this question. How did you know where I was? How did you know where the sound was coming from? It's pressure waves. It's how did you know where it was coming from? How? <laughs> I mean, yes, but how? Okay. And then, and then okay. for like different people, just either it's louder for them, like if they were like right in the front row, right, or like in the back, they could right. still hear it. But then. Although I agree with you, except that would require some sort of comparison between like yeah. Max and you, which didn't happen unless you guys have some sort of mental thing I don't know about. Yeah. How much time it took the sound to get there? So like, how long? But you don't know how. You don't know when I started. So I agree with you. There's got to be something else involved. Michael. It's kind of like it's louder at the center point, so if you're looking elsewhere and you hear it louder over here, you know it's louder over there. Louder over there. You know I was over there. What if I was just over here and I was like a lot louder? If I was just like shouting. A lot louder. Think that would work? Probably not. Yeah. It's the difference in loudness between two ears. Oh. So you have two ears. So a difference in loudness between your two ears. So maybe, like, I was right in front of Kevin for the most part. So maybe I was like almost equal volume for his two ears, but I was way over here. So you right for me louder in his right ear than his left ear. Maybe. Okay. All right. Let's try again. Let's try. Let's let's. Let's sit on that assumption for a while, okay? Let's try this again. Eyes closed. Let's try this again. Eyes closed. Point. Point. Eyes open. 100% accuracy. 100% accuracy. No, I couldn't really tell. I saw you pointing. Okay, so you pointed at the wall. Here's the issue. Here's the issue with our earlier hypothesis, and I was using Raphael as a, as a scapegoat here, as a guinea pig, maybe that's a better example. So, I was the exact same distance right and left to his ears. But somehow he knew that I was behind him. How did he know I was the same distance left to right? How did he know I was behind him? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Is it because yeah. the sound waves reached his right ear earlier? But I'm the same distance, right? So how would it reach earlier if I was here versus there? Earlier if I was here versus there. Science. Science. Sure. Science. 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 You. The distance of the street. You from him didn't change his direction of his face changed, which made the. Uh, um, this is yeah, I like where you're going with that. So, something about his ears, the orientation of his ears, figured out that I was over there. And a lot of that comes down to these big floppy things you have on the side of your head. Okay, yeah, the outer ear here. This outer ear is not just here for good looks. Okay? What it does is it helps shape and direct sound. So whether it's conscious or not, and it's probably not, you're not like, oh, clearly, because the sound sounded differently. I knew that he was behind me and 12 feet to the right, right? Your brain does all that processing sort of on a base level before it gets to your conscious level. With Raviel, because it sounded differently, because this outer ear shaped it differently as it was coming in, he knew I was behind him. Experiment number three. As I continue to talk, and I'll try and fill the talk here, I want you to make your ears bigger. I want you to make your ears bigger. Okay? So how I want you to do that, don't just pull on this one. Okay? Yeah. Cup your hands behind your ears, kind of like this, 
and listen to how different the sound is. If you cup your hands behind your ears, you're going to hear way different sounds. It's going to sound significantly different. I'm not like speaking Japanese all of a sudden or anything, but the sound is completely different. Let's try this. Why don't you talk a little bit like that? Talk a little bit. Say something with your with your hands behind your ears. You can try there. Put your hands away. Bring them back. Put your hands away. Bring them back. Oh, it does sound that is a little bit like how people hear you, although um, when, you're talking, um, when you're talking, it vibrates the bones of your face, which really changes the sound. So it's when, like you know, when you, you hear a recording of your voice, you're like, Ugh, that's how I sound? Um, because you sound so different to yourself. So these outer ears really help shape that sound, right? They really help figure out kind of where something is. Right. Let's try one more experiment. This is the last one. Let's try one more experiment, okay? So I want you to close your eyes and we'll point again. So close your eyes. Point. Eyes open. Eyes open. Okay, so how'd you all know I was up here? Because you did this on a computer up here last year. <laughs> How'd you all know I was up here? I had been up here. Didn't? Magic. Didn't? Magic. I'm always I'm a word of So, so not only is our ear shaping forward and back, our ear shaping forward and back, but you'll notice that your ear isn't the same top and bottom either, right? It's a different shape above the ear and below the ear. That can also help us determine what's above and what's below. What's above and what's below. Have you ever, uh, See, uh, animals, sometimes animals have really big ears, right? Because they're tuned to hear things. Right? You ever make a weird sound in front of a dog? And it goes like this? Right? Maybe your cat does that? Something about turning the head. Now you're going to get a second sample of that sound with your ears in a different position. Okay. When you get that second sample of sound with your ears in a different position, the brain can do some processing and try to figure out where that is. Now, why do you suppose we have all this really fancy processing of sound in order to figure out position? Why would we want that in a hunter-gatherer sort of a sense? Why would that be a good thing? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you think about that primal like predator-prey situation, it's really important that A, I'd be able to track something and eat it, and B, make sure that something isn't attacking me. That is low, low level. That's before conscious thought that your brain processes and tells you where a noise is. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat stuff. We, as humans, actually have a vestigial muscle. Some of us, not everybody. Do you know what vestigial means? Uh, don't need it, but it's still there. Great point. Don't, don't need it, but it's still there. So it's, it's left over. So some humans have the ability, this vestigial muscle, to wiggle the ears a little bit. Not every human, but some have the ability to wiggle their ears a little bit. That's left over from when we had larger ears and more individual control. So I could, you know, I could, I could move the ears, try and get better directional control, better positionality for sound. Kind of, yeah, like some people can do it, some people can Although I don't know what the uh, evolutionary benefit of curling your tongue over you. I don't know. Yeah, you can suck on a straw. Yeah, maybe. Like there, there's like some flower that's like really good. Um, so it's pretty cool that all this is happening sort of below Below our consciousness level, that if these things are happening, our brain is processing. That's pretty neat. Now I'll come to these, these waves. All right. So we talked about the shapes of waves. We talked a little bit about frequency. Okay. We've got to we've got to introduce two other terms that we need to know about. Okay. Two other terms we need to know about. Our period, our period and amplitude. And amplitude. Okay? So period, so period is the time from when the wave starts, the wave starts 
to when it repeats. Traditionally, it's taken that zero line, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Anytime we see a repeating wave, if we can find the spot where it repeats, that's the period. So for example, I could take the period from here to here. Or from here to here. Wherever I see it repeat, that's the period. And depending on my wavelength, that could be a big number, that could be a small number. Okay, it doesn't really matter. But that number is represented in seconds. Okay? So the period is going to be represented in seconds. It might be milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, but it's still in seconds. But it's still in seconds. Okay? Frequency is represented in hertz. Here from Henry Hertz. So frequency. Frequency is in hertz. And again, it could be hertz, it could be kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. Hertz. Times per second. That's a frequency. Now, what's neat for you guys, a little math uh, here. These equations are actually pretty easy. Period is 1 over frequency. By that token, by that token, frequency, frequency is what? Is what? So I know. One over. One over. Period. Period. Okay. So you can just swap those two. So frequency is one over period, and period is one over frequency. So if you have one, it's very easy to figure out the other. Very easy to figure out. Alright? Period and frequency. Why is this important? Well, we're going to need to measure waves. We're going to need to look at a oscilloscope. Okay, the oscilloscope is a device that measures waves, and we'll look at them, and we'll look at, and we'll determine what the frequency is. Because there's not a really good way to measure a frequency visually. I got to look at my period, and then figure out the frequency from there. What would you hear differently if the frequency were higher? What would, what would it sound like? The frequency got higher, what would it sound like? More shrill. The pitch goes up. Would it be louder? Not necessarily. Now, we might perceive a difference in volume, uh, but it's not actually going to be any louder. Where the loudness comes from is amplitude. Amplitude is a measure of the height of my wave. Okay. Amplitude is the height of the wave. That's the voltage in our electrical sense. And more voltage, bigger wave. What do you think that means in terms of sound? Louder, right? More pressure. You feel more pressure. It, 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 we perceive it as louder. That's amplitude. Now, there are a couple ways to describe amplitude. If I go from zero to the top of the wave, that's called peak amplitude. That's one way to describe amplitude. We can also go to the very top to the very bottom. That's called peak to peak amplitude. Peak to peak. A lot of times, peak to peak is the easiest one to measure. Because on an oscilloscope, you may not know exactly where zero is. Where was where was halfway up the wave, right? Do I know? Is it here? Was it here? It's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly where half the wave is. So it's a lot easier to just go, okay, that is my measurement. That's peak to peak amplitude. As I get more amplitude, it's going to perceive. We're going to see that's loud. We're going to see that's loud. Less amplitude, it's going to see that's quiet. Amplitude, period. Those are going to be pretty darn important to us. Now, when I look at an oscilloscope, what I'm going to see is like almost like graphing over the wave. You're going to see a bunch of lines like this. And 
bunch of lines going across like that. That's what you're going to see in an oscilloscope. Grip. Right? Tomorrow, we're going to be working um, in multi-sim a little bit, looking at these oscilloscopes. Okay? But when I look at this grid, that's how I'm going to make my measurements. So it will tell you what each of these boxes or divisions represents. So this box might be 2 volts. You might say it's 2 volts per division. 2 volts per division. What that means is every box is 2 volts. So I might ask you, what is the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of this wave? You'd look at it and you'd say, hmm, well, the very top of the wave and the very bottom of the wave, that's peak to peak amplitude. How many boxes is it from the top of the wave to the bottom of the wave? How many divisions? Okay, so it looks like one, two, three, four, five, Four, maybe a little bit, because Mr. Crash is sloppy with his writing. One, two, three, four. Four divisions. And how many volts per division? Well, we said two. That's what your oscilloscope will tell you. It'll tell you volts per division. So if it's two volts per division, and I have four divisions, I'm looking at about eight volts. Eight volts. Eight volts. Measuring period is the same thing, but instead of volts per division, it's Seconds, seconds per division. Okay, so let's say it's one second per division. What is the period of this wave? Say, okay, how many divisions is uh, the wave here? Look at that cheating. Get the program. All right, so one division, two divisions, three divisions, four divisions. One second per division. What is the period of my wave? Four seconds. Four seconds. So you figure out the amplitude. So you figure out, the you figure out the period. Now, what's the frequency? So, so frequency I cannot get from this graph. Directly. I have to get period first, which I said was four seconds. Then I can throw it into this equation right here. Frequency is one over period. So frequency is one over four. So my frequency is a quarter hertz. One over four hertz, 0.25 hertz, or 250 millihertz. That's a pretty slow frequency. That's pretty slow. It's four seconds. Four seconds. So that's what you're going to be looking at when you get into multi-sim. You're going to see those uh, different frequencies. It's five minutes. Um, you're going to see those different frequencies in multi-sim. Okay? We're also going to use our um, MIDAC. We haven't had a chance to use yet. These little white boxes that have multimeters in them and all these different things. And we're going to create functions out of them. We're going to create waves. And we're also going to look at waves and see if we can get you guys to talk into them and, and see your wave and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so that's kind of what we'll do tomorrow. We'll mess around with the oscilloscope, okay? um, and I'll show you guys a couple of quick little shortcuts. There are, what's nice is that I sort of on purpose drew my grid lines so they would pretty obviously hit parts of the wave. Well, that's not always the case, right? If you have a a 17.31 hertz wave, it's not going to perfectly line up on your grid. So multi-sim has these little tools where you can actually just line it up and it does the math for you, which is really nice. Alright? Wake up. Alright. Anybody have any questions on waves? I gotta close with one bit of information. Okay. And that is that a square wave, a square wave is not always a digital signal. 
A digital signal is always a square wave. But a square wave is not always a digital signal. Okay? It's like that whole square is a rectangle, the rectangle is not necessarily a square term of the deal, right? If my square wave starts at zero and goes to some value, whatever it is, 3.3 or 5 or whatever, that's a digital signal. If you have a square wave that's like my sine wave here, where zero is in the middle, and it goes positive negative, that is not a digital signal. Digital signals never go negative. In fact, if they do, you destroy your equipment. Okay. Digital is about predictability. We don't ever throw voltage back. Okay. So if you see this, this is not a digital signal. It's not a digital signal. We can create a digital signal in a lot of different ways. We're going to do that in class uh, this week or next week. We're going to create digital signals. But the important thing will be that zero is down here. We never lose your neck. That's going to be the really crucial thing. All right. All right. That's all I have for you today. We may ruminate on sound, etc.